The United States is prepared to deal with this crisis, both at home and in the region. Every Ebola outbreak over the past 40 years has been stopped. We know how to do this, and we will do it again. With America's leadership, I'm confident, and President Obama is confident, that this epidemic will also be stopped. So with that, let me uh, turn the podium over to Secretary Burwell. Thank you, Lisa. Since the outbreak began, the United States government has been engaged in preparation both at home and abroad to protect our homeland and stop the epidemic at its source. We've been working for many months to ensure that the United States is protected. CDC sent out our first guidance to state and local officials on July 28th, and it's been followed with six additional sets of guidance, and the latest was just issued yesterday. In addition, we have enhanced our surveillance and laboratory testing capacity in states to make sure that they're able to detect cases. Been in regular and repeated contact with state officials and health departments, including developing guidance and tools for departments to conduct public health investigations. We're continuing to provide guidance for flight crews, emergency medical service units at airports, and customs and border patrol officers about reporting Ill, tra Ill travelers to the CDC. And we're continuing to work with hospitals and healthcare workers around the country to prepare most effectively, both in terms of detecting symptoms and then responding appropriately. <laughs> As we saw just a few months ago, almost two months ago, in Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, and at Mount Sinai in New York, hospitals and healthcare systems reacted and took appropriate steps. Fortunately, in those cases, the cases were not positive. We saw Emory's ability to handle the first cases that returned from West Africa, followed by the Nebraska Medical Center's ability to do the same. In Dallas, the public health system is now handling the case with the protocols that we know control this disease. We recognize the concern that even a single case of Ebola creates on our shores. But we have the public health systems and the public health providers in place to contain the spread of this disease. We've taken a number of precautions to prevent the spread. We've instituted exit screening procedures in West Africa to prevent those who have been exposed to Ebola or are sick with Ebola from traveling. The Department of Homeland Security is in the process of advising all travelers returning to the U.S. from countries with Ebola outbreaks in West Africa to monitor their health for 21 days and to immediately seek medical help if any symptoms do develop. The Centers for Disease Control stands ready, as it has in Dallas, to deploy expert teams when needed. Finally, our scientists at the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institutes of Health are working tirelessly to develop new va vaccines and treatments for Ebola. We remain focused on working with our partners on the ground to stop the epidemic at its source, and we're continuing to take the necessary precautions across the United States government to prevent the epidemic from spreading further. And I'd like to now turn to Dr. Tony Fauci, who is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH, to talk a little bit about epidemiology. Thank you very much, Secretary Burwell. Uh, I'd like to provide some basic but important facts about Ebola and its transmission. Although Ebola is an extremely serious viral disease with a high fatality rate, it is not easily transmitted. Specifically, the Ebola virus is not easily spread like a cold or influenza. You must come into direct contact with the bodily fluids of a sick person or through exposure to objects that have been contaminated with infected bodily fluids. Ebola is not a respiratory disease like the flu, and so it is not transmitted through the air. This is important. Individuals who are not symptomatic are not contagious. In order for the virus to be transmitted, an individual would have to have direct contact with an individual who is experiencing symptoms or who has died of the disease. 
We have considerable experience in dealing with Ebola, both in controlling and in preventing outbreaks. This is based on experience with almost two dozen outbreaks in Central Africa since the virus was first isolated in 1976. The key elements to that control and the prevention of outbreaks when Ebola rises in a community is to first identify cases, isolate them, care for them under conditions that protect the healthcare workers, and importantly, perform contact tracing. People in direct contact with a sick Ebola patient should be monitored for symptoms for at least 21 days. If no symptoms arise, the individual is cleared. If symptoms arise, the person is appropriately isolated and cared for. This formula has worked very well over many years. The situation in West Africa has been very difficult, largely due to the lack of an adequate health care infrastructure to deal with the outbreak. And so I want to reiterate what the Secretary said. Our health care infrastructure in the United States is well equipped to stop Ebola in its tracks. As the Secretary said, in addition to managing the issues associated with containing the situation in Dallas as it exists today and addressing the very dire situation as it exists in Africa today, we are working very aggressively and energetically to develop and test a vaccine to prevent Ebola and therapeutics to treat it. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Raj Shah, the administrator of USAID. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to describe the effort in West Africa, which, as has been noted, includes a major effort to control the disease, inc includes uh, specific actions to deal with the secondary impacts of the crisis in several West African countries, including making food, water, and government support more available, and the effort to build out an international coalition, as Lisa previously discussed. Our response in West Africa started in the spring and accelerated dramatically over the summer. This coordinated civilian response included the largest ever disaster assistance response team uh, from USAID, the largest ever more than 100 person centers for disease control, disease control capability deployed to Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and countries throughout the region, and efforts partnering with our Department of Defense colleagues to more than double the laboratory and diagnostic capacity in West Africa to ensure that cases could be identified and positively confirmed. Since that time, we've helped deliver more than 120,000 sets of personal protective equipment, build out Ebola treatment units, provide technical assistance for airport screening throughout the region, and increase the basic capacity of what, what has been a weak existing healthcare infrastructure to deal with this disease. As the President noted in his comments at the Centers for Disease Control a few weeks ago, our strategy now is clear. First, we are investing in a strong incident command system at the national and local level throughout the region to identify cases and trace contacts. Second, we are building out Ebola treatment units so that enough bed capacity exists for as many positively identified patients as possible to receive isolation and treatment. We are on path to put in place the WHO plan of more than 2,800 beds in Liberia, according to their timeline, and just in the last 10 days have seen significant new Ebola treatment capability come online, including the largest Ebola treatment unit in Liberia, the new Island Clinic, which we helped build and staff. Third, we're engaging in an extensive community care strategy that includes uh, 10 to 20 bed community care center units that are placed throughout rural communities in particular to help isolate patients in those communities and support the distribution of hygiene and protective equipment kits so families can protect their uh, patients and their families. We've distributed more than 9,000 of those kits together with UNICEF and the World Health Organization and are on path to have about 10,000 arrive in country and be distributed through Liberia on a weekly basis. In recent days, we've been successful in scaling up the effort to reach, identify, reach, and in a safe and dignified manner, 
uh, deal with bodies of patients who are deceased from Ebola. We now have more than 50 safe burial teams with full protective equipment and careful protocols in place. And we're, we're noting that more than three quarters of all bodies in Liberia of positively identified patients are now being cleared safely within the 24 hour period. This is critically important because that is an important existing mode of transmission. I'd further note that the scale up of Centers for Disease Control and USAID efforts through June and August was quite significant, but the complexity of building out Ebola treatment units and providing the logistics support in terms of protective equipment and medicines uh, required the significant additional resources brought by the Department of Defense and announced by President Obama. So I'm pleased to introduce General David Rodriguez, the commander of Africa Command, to describe those specific efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Administrator. As we deploy America's sons and daughters to support the comprehensive United States government effort led by the United States Agency for International Development, we'll do everything in our power to address and mitigate any potential risk to our service members, civilian employees, and their families. As uh, Director Shaw, or Administrator Shaw mentioned, the uh, areas that we're focusing on are command and control, and that is to help support and coordinate uh, the efforts of uh, both USAID and the international community. Uh, we are uh, also working on training, training the people who man and manage the Ebola treatment units. We're uh, supporting uh, the engineering efforts to build out the uh, Ebola treatment units, and we're also uh, doing an uh, effort in the uh, area of logistics, which uh, this is a tremendous list logistics effort, as uh, the administrator pointed out. Uh, for our soldiers prior to deployment, we'll provide them the best equipment and training that we can. We are assessing risk based on the service member's mission, their location, and their activities in execution of their operations. We're implementing procedures to reduce or eliminate the risk of transmission as service members go about their daily missions, including the use of personal protective equipment, hygiene protocols, and monitoring. Prior to redeploying service members back home, we will screen and identify anyone who faced an elevated risk of exposure well, we take all necessary steps to minimize any potential transmission in accordance with the international standards that our medical professionals have given us. In the end, our training, procedures, and most of all, the discipline of our leaders and our force will help us to ensure that our team accomplishes its mission without posing a risk to our nation and our fellow citizens. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, General Rodriguez. I, first, I want to thank our, um, uh, the folks who are with me at the podium, uh, but most importantly, the dedicated military, medical, and development professionals that they represent and who are working so hard in this problem. Uh, I think with that, we're happy to take your questions. Monica, um, yeah. you're talking about the giving back sheets out to passengers who arrived from these Ebola countries. Why not do some more active screening, like ask people, have you had a fever? Um, have you been in contact with people? That's been done, at least in some countries and other circumstances. It would, on the face of it, seem a reasonable thing to do. So uh, I think this goes directly to what Dr. Fauci talked about, which is this, and uh, what Secretary Burwell talked about. We are uh, taking steps to address the source uh, the uh, people coming from the source countries, and we think those are the most effective steps we can take. The temperature testing, the questionnaires, the testing for, uh, for fever, uh, and making sure that people who are symptomatic, and, and as Dr. Fauci has said, and uh, Dr. Tom Frieden has talked about this repeatedly, uh, you cannot get Ebola other than from direct contact with bodily fluids of somebody who is, at that time, symptomatic. So the most effective way to go about controlling this is to prevent those individuals from getting on a plane in the first place. And I think it's important to remember uh, that since these measures have been in place, uh, dozens and dozens of people have been stopped from getting on flights uh, in the region. But we now know people have gotten on planes anyway. So why not have the U.S. Customs and Immigration people ask them? Clearly, it's not been effective to do it merely on the African side. Well, I think what we've seen is uh, we've had uh, an, an individual in Texas who did come uh, to this country and later became symptomatic 
and that person is now being isolated uh, and uh, dealt with, and uh, significant contact tracing is being done. Now, your question about uh, passive versus more active screening, I think, is an understandable one. But as uh, Director, uh, I'm sorry, Secretary Burwell indicated, we've taken a number of steps to ensure that Customs and Border Patrol individuals are uh, uh, teams are trained. Uh, to identify uh, symptomatic individuals and where they uh, do uh, present uh, people who may be symptomatic. Uh, they have instructions about what to do and how to handle that. Now, that all of which is to say uh, that we are constantly going to evaluate what may be the most effective measures we can take. Secretary Johnson uh, is constantly evaluating that with his team and in consultation with the medical professionals. Right now, the most effective measures we think are focusing at uh, the source countries and taking the steps, the very concerted training uh, and um, uh, precautionary measures and notification measures that we've taken with the CBP folks here uh, on the receiving end. Um, talk kind of in broad terms about uh, hospital procedures here, and obviously in Dallas there have been breakdowns in the system at a couple of points. I'm just wondering specifically lessons learned from the Dallas situation um, that you're talking to hospitals about. And while we have you here, we'll be, uh, you can tell us what the U.S. knows about the latest Islamic State video that we've seen with this British hostage and a, another American on this video as well. Uh, on that latter issue, Julie, let me just address that and uh, then ask um, Secretary Burwell and Dr. Fauci to address um, uh, the medical measures in Texas within the constraints that I'm sure you understand they'd be operating in. Uh, we are aware uh, and have seen and are evaluating uh, the newest video. Uh, if it in fact proves to be authentic, it is yet another demonstration of the brutality uh, of ISIL. And our hearts go out uh, to uh, the, the uh, British aid worker uh, who we believe uh, is in that video uh, and uh, to the remaining hostages and to their families. This is, again, yet another uh, uh, just a very clear example of the brutality uh, of this group and why the President has articulated and is moving out uh, in a comprehensive way to degrade and destroy ISIL. Let me now uh, turn to my colleagues on the latter part of your question. With regard to uh, the efforts that the CDC is pursuing and that we've been pursuing, as I mentioned, you know, we've had the uh, efforts in Charlotte. We saw and we saw the system work. We saw it work in Mount Sinai. We have a case here. Actually, I think everyone knows, you know, Howard and the question there. And so the systems are in place. We continue to communicate. We continue to give good instruction. I think it is important to reflect on whatever lessons we learn. We build and incorporate. As I said, we'd issued a seventh pond, uh, a seventh one of these health alert network notices to make sure that if there are any lessons learned as we go forward, we will continue to incorporate those. Can, Can I follow on that, please? What the lesson learned from some of these failures in Dallas was and how, the, how you may be changing or modifying uh, any lessons from What we know are the critical steps that we have said throughout the process, and that is about identification, and identification at the point at which there actually is a temperature, and as Dr. Fauci said, when something can be done. What we are doing is making sure that hospitals, health workers across the country know that when they see that, what steps to take, how to isolate, and what to do immediately when they see those steps. And we'll continue to do that and make sure that we are responding to the questions that we're getting from the community. Secretary, what about, what about the case, uh, potential case at Howard University? Is there any new information about that? And to Dr. Fauci, uh, if it doesn't spread like the flu or a cold, why is it spreading so quickly, and are you confident that we won't see an outbreak in the U.S.? With regard to the Nigeria case, haven't seen the results of the test yet, and I think that's the most definitive thing and the most important thing. And what you see is people taking precautions because the symptoms are malarial, but they could be this. And so I think everyone is taking the appropriate steps, and it gets to the earlier question. We believe that's the right thing to do. CDC gets contacted. We make a determination uh, and work with the uh, community and the health center in this case to do the test when we get that definitive as you know, in each of the cases, we make public as quickly as possible uh, what we know about that. And, uh, I'll There's let, also a patient being I'll tested at Shady Grove Adventist that I'm, I'm led to believe. Are you being informed of all of these suspected cases? Do you want to answer the one question? Yeah, let, let me answer the, the question here first. So you were saying if it isn't, if it's only uh, uh, transmitted a certain way, right? Why is there such an outbreak? If one goes to 
uh, Liberia or uh, Sierra Leone or Guinea, you will see the conditions that make it very, very clear that coming into contact with bodily fluids, the most efficient way of, present, of, of, of transmission is unfortunately the very thing that holds families together. Someone gets sick, they take care of them, they touch them. If they're not aware of the fact that you can't come into personal contact without having the proper protective equipment, Funerals are another way, as well as preparing the bodies and the customs, the long-range traditions that have gone with the funerals. So the mechanism of transmission, which we've all said, direct contact with body fluids, amply explains what is going on right now in the West African countries. And you're convinced no significant outbreak in the U.S.? Yeah, the, the, the reason I say that, as I said, let me just very briefly reiterate it. The reason there is an outbreak now is because the, the healthcare infrastructure and system in those countries is inadequate and in, incapable of actually handling the kind of identification, isolation, rapid treatment, protection of the people who are coming to contact, and contact tracing. That's something that we have very, very well established here. So we have a case now and it is entirely conceivable there may be another case. But the reason that we feel confident is that our structure, our ability to do those things, would preclude an outbreak. Let me just take um, uh, this gentleman's question here, the question of are we being notified of cases? And this goes, I think, directly to what Dr. Fauci just said. We have a system, we have an infrastructure uh, that is in place. Uh, we have a public health alert system through which CDC has distributed information from uh, and established a laboratory network for testing. So when there are uh, potential symptomatic uh, individuals who present themselves in medical facilities, those precautions that are immediately taken, those tests are um, uh, under uh, undertaken through a network of laboratories that CDC has validated and has provided a clear guidance to. So we have the structure in place when we identify potential cases to resolve those. And if there are uh, uh, actually confirmed Ebola cases, as we have seen one of in Texas, we take the immediate steps isolate them, provide the treatment, undertake the contact tracing, and our infrastructure uh, works in, to uh, make sure we are aware of those cases and take those steps. So the Secretary Burwell said we had a case at Howard, but did not say we had another, a, a potential case, I'm sorry, did not say we had another potential case at Shady Grove Adventist. And the hospital has already put out a release. Are there only two, are there more than those two? In, Washington, in the Washington area? Right, right, right now, uh, you've you've indicated uh, and you've talked about uh, the potential case at Howard. We'll see the resolution of that as uh, Secretary Burwell uh, discussed. And the potential case of Shady Grove Adventist. Those reports, as they come in, they will be addressed. They will; those tests will be undertaken. The uh, the public health uh, infrastructure is reacting and uh, is taking the steps necessary to isolate that individual. I think uh, perhaps Dr. Fauci will want to address this, or Secretary Burwell. But every hospital in this country has the capability to isolate a patient, take the measures. Uh, put them uh, in place to ensure that any suspected case is immediately isolated and the follow-up steps that have been mentioned are, are immediately taken. Lisa, 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 so to what degree have you debated internally and are you ever going to be prepared to recommend to the President what some have suggested publicly today, a travel ban for these three countries for any passengers who may seek to come to the United States either directly or indirectly. In general, if you could tell us how do you think your deployed assets are as far as catching up with what you intend to do? And do you think it's time at some point to have military medical people actually involved in the direct care as opposed to setting up the infrastructure in which care will be taken out? I'll take your, uh, the travel ban question first. I know that that has been something, uh, an issue that has been raised. Uh, I've, uh, I take note of uh, Dr. Frieden's uh, comments in this regard, which is to say that, in fact, uh, right now we believe those types of steps actually impede the response. They uh, impede and slow down the ability of uh, the United States and other international partners to actually get expertise and capabilities uh, and equipment into the affected areas. And 
as we've said and stressed from this podium and others, the most important and effective thing we can do is to control the epidemic at its source. So what we want to be able to do is ensure we're getting the assistance, we're getting the expertise, and we're um, getting the providers into the affected region and not impeding that. But I mean, General Lisa, Rodriguez? before you go, uh, many Americans might say, well, wound half a band, not getting there, but exiting. Are you, are you considering that actively? Well, let, let me just respond to that. As I mentioned, as the um, measures are being taken to screen individuals who are departing from the affected countries, and we've spoken to that, uh, professionals actually have um, uh, provided the assistance and the training and the advice to uh, airport officials in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. And as a result of those measures and those screening um, uh, steps that have uh, been undertaken, many, many people, dozens of people, have actually been stopped from traveling. So uh, we see those issues, uh, those steps actually being effective. General. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, for us, uh, the speed with which we're moving out is really focused on the uh, Ebola treatment units to get them there. That will take us several weeks. We are working with the Armed Forces of Liberia. We're working with uh, contractors, and we're working with a uh, logistics uh, chain of events to get the bill of materials there as fast as we can, and it'll take us several weeks to do that. And we will get the, uh, we are also doing some of the ones in some fairly isolated areas that are hard to uh, to support and get the equipment out there. So that, they, those will take us the longest. On the other one, sir, right now we are not uh, anticipating that uh, military uh, personnel will be treating the people, and again, that will be a decision made in the future if that ever gets to that point. But the international community has said, uh, right, not right now, is that's not what we need. You do have we do have folks capable of doing that, don't you? No, uh, yes, we do. We also, uh, right now, as you say, uh, medical professionals. There are three labs uh, that are operating out there that are done by military medical professionals right now, and that's uh, doing a great job identifying who has the uh, disease and who doesn't, which is focusing who they're able to treat the patients, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Have you considered a waiting uh, period between Mike, issuing a visa and travel? Um, as Josh would say, I think we're going to move around a little bit. <laughs> so, so help me understand the, the stuff that you've talked about in terms of preparedness here in this country, the, the, the conversations with the hospitals, the coordination with the local authorities and all, seems very dissonant, I think, to people in the country who look at basically the first case or one of the first cases and see that the whole thing broke down. At every step of the way, there were breakdowns. It broke down, as the person back there was saying, when he lied on the form. It broke down when the hospital turned him away. It broke down when the materials that were in his apartment haven't been thrown away. It broke down, I mean, it, it feels like, to, to Americans, like you guys are up here talking about, we have this great and perfect system that's going to be able to you know, contain this virus because we've done all this preparation, and yet it, it doesn't look like it's working. And so what, how, how, does, how should the regular, the average person have confidence that whether it's the case in Howard or whether it's some case somewhere else in the country at the moment, that somebody isn't being turned away there, that somebody didn't get, you know, uh, their temperature got taken in Africa but didn't get caught, so they're on a plane as we speak. And what, how, square the, the, the dissonance between your confidence in the fact that things don't seem to be working. Let me uh, respond to that and ask my colleagues if they want to add. I think the American people should be confident for all the reasons that we have stated and the President has spoken to. And that is because the public health infrastructure we have here is so expert, is so extensive, uh, and is considerable. Uh, and as Dr. Fauci has discussed and uh, Dr. Shaw has mentioned, uh, the situation in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea uh, could not be more opposite in terms of the public health infrastructure and the ability uh, of uh, uh, and the ability of officials there to immediately isolate an individual case. What you're seeing in Texas is uh, the the isolation of that patient, the contact tracing that is being done uh, meticulously uh, by CDC and uh, local uh, health professionals. Uh, the other thing I would say uh, to your question is. It is true, we have uh, a case in Texas. Uh, the Howard uh, uh, case that has been mentioned is a potential case, uh, and I will uh, defer uh, to the medical professionals at Howard uh, to give the definitive uh, uh, view on that. Uh, but I think it's very important to remember, this outbreak uh, began in March of this year. Uh, and uh, since that time, and since the screening measures that we've discussed uh, from this podium uh, began over the summer, 
Uh, there have been tens of thousands of individuals who have come to this country from the affected region. And we have now seen one case, and as Dr. Fauci mentioned, it is entirely possible we will see another case. However, I would uh, point uh, you uh, and others to the fact that we have now seen tens of thousands of people in the time since March to the current, uh, to the current day, and we now uh, have this isolated case uh, in uh, Texas. But we have a public health infrastructure and medical professionals throughout this country who are capable uh, of dealing uh, with cases if they present themselves. And as uh, Dr. Frieden has said, we are very confident that we can stop uh, this and other cases in its tracks. Can Let me explain, ask my colleagues to come up. Can you explain within that public health infrastructure yeah, what the lines of authority are? If, once you have a confirmed case, for example, in, in Dallas, does the CDC, does the NIH, is there a federal authority? Is it up to the local health department? Who, who, who's in charge at that point? Uh, with regard to uh, one of the things, when any test is done, it is reported to CDC. So we have a network and we want the tests to be able to go quickly. So part of the preparedness that we did was we created capability all around the country for the tests to occur so that they could occur quickly. We want that to happen so that they're not all just coming to CDC. However, when that test occurs, CDC is alerted to the test occurring and the results of the test. With regard to who controls the patient, I think is the question, that is done at the local level and we support in that and the 10 people were on the ground from CDC immediately I think you all know in terms of supporting the local health departments in doing the contact tracing and any other issues that they have whether they're issues of the testing whether they're issues of the contact tracing we stand ready to do that and so while the local uh, health officials because this is a local issue and that's really a big part of how you're going to do the contact tracing and they make the decisions on the ground. We are there hand in hand in support, had 10 people on the ground and work hand in glove with them. On the contact tracing, because some people in Dallas are concerned about the contact group being isolated in a, in a highly congested apartment area, I think that some of them there's an expression that they should be moved. Is that a protocol that, that could be repeated in other communities, that the contact tracing group, if they're isolated for some period of time, are, are, that's the best place to keep them in, a, in an environment where it may be a high density apartment? Yeah. That gets to the earlier question with regard to how local officials are handling uh, their situation specifically. I think Dr. Fauci has gone over the way and the protocol. When you have not had a high risk exposure, what needs to happen is basic temperature taking two times a day on a regular basis. High risk exposure creates different needs. How uh, a local official, how local officials choose to implement that, we work in conjunction. Give our, uh, you know, give we have given the guidance out in terms of what we do. But those are decisions made at the local level. Two other quick questions. One is, can you update I think us? We are, I have to do the Josh quick, move around thing, wait, I think is the, the rule of the, the, oh, the rule. Can you update? When Dr. Fauci comes back up, he'll do that, but we'll take this question. I'm sure he will. Mine is also a very quick follow-up. Is nobody concerned that there are these breakdowns in Dallas? And are you really confident that there's not going to be similar breakdowns elsewhere along the same line? I think when I spoke to the fact that uh, we continue to work on our education and continue to work with locals and put out more and more information, we put out more information and updated information. Whenever there is anything that we see that we could do a better job on communicating, we will do that. And so this is, as I think the general mentioned too, we are, we are going to learn every time and every step, but I think what we're confident about is these processes work. If you look what happened in Nigeria, in terms of the cases in Nigeria, what happened is we quickly activated, and, and CDC was a part of supporting um, the country of Nigeria, both at the state and federal level, to put in place the things that it needed to put in place. We know it's about detect, isolation, treat the patient, do the contact tracing. Those are the steps. And now we see where we are in Nigeria in terms of uh, the cases and them having moved through. And this, I think, Dr. Fauci mentioned. And so we believe that as we take these steps, these key core fundamental steps, and we are in the middle of that in Dallas in terms of the contact tracing and making sure that the people that should be uh, you know, 
taking the temperatures or doing that. And so that's how we and why we believe that this is going to work. Should we get, let me go to uh, Dr. Fauci with the vaccine question. Okay, I'll ask the, answer the vaccine question in a second, but I just wanted to make the point that you were making. Uh, there were things that did not go the way they should have in Dallas, but there are a lot of things that went right and are going right. If you look at them, the person is now in isolation being properly taken care of, and the fundamental core basis of preventing an outbreak, contact tracing, is now going on. And that's the important thing, and that's going on very efficiently. The CDC sets down very clear guideline protocols about how to do that, and that's being done. So although certainly it was rocky to the perception of people in reality, but the fact is, the reason I said there wouldn't be an outbreak is because what's going on right now. So even though there were missteps there, there were good things that happened also. So to, yeah, yeah, with regard to the vaccine, I don't know who asked the, the question of the vaccine. Well, obviously we would hope that vaccine could be a part of the response, even though public health infection control is still the core of getting this under control, vaccine historically is important. So we have a vaccine, a couple of candidates. The one that's most advanced is the one that we announced just a while ago. The first person in a phase one trial received a vaccine on September the 2nd at the NIH in Bethesda. That's the first phase of a multi-phase trial to develop a vaccine. It's called phase one because its primary endpoint is safety. If we determine that it's safe and it looks good so far, and also that it induces a response that you would predict would be protective, which we'll know probably by the end of November, the beginning of December. When you get through that phase, then the next phase is a phase two, which is many, many more people conducted in the environment where you could prove its efficacy, and that would be West Africa. So the next phase, sometime likely in the first quarter of 2015, we'll begin a trial to determine overall long-range safety and, importantly, whether it works or not. Lisa? Yeah, one last question. Uh, Dr. Fossil, for you, if I could. I understand that the purpose of this briefing is to reassure the American public, right. and you've done that, and probably justifiably so. But as a medical professional, as a doctor, what concerns you most about this outbreak and this particular disease right. now that it's in the United States? Right. Now that it's in the United States, the concern is that I don't ever like to see people get sick and people suffer and die. But as a medical professional who has witnessed and experienced the whole 38 years since 1976, I never say I'm not concerned because that's interpreted as taking something lightly. I take nothing lightly. But I'm convinced by what we have all said today that the system that's in place with our healthcare infrastructure would make it extraordinarily unlikely that we would have an outbreak. And the reason we know that is that if you look at the situations, and Nigeria, as the Secretary mentioned, is a classic example of that. The reason we are having this devastating, painful, very difficult situation in the Af West African countries is because they don't have the system to be able to contain it. If they had the system, we would not be seeing and dying in West Africa. Up, if that's the case, and if it's one case in the United States now, as we know it is, right. why are we having news conferences like this, and why are we all so afraid? Well, if, this, if there's no chance of an outbreak, right. what is it about this disease that frightens sure. you and us? Okay, so we're having the press conference because we need to get information out because there is a lot of fear. And the reason there's a lot of fear is that there are many things when you have outbreaks. It's the unknown, it's the cataclysmic nature of it. Namely, it's acute, it kills in a high percentage, and it kills quickly. That in and of itself, almost intuitively, makes people frightened. The other thing that makes people frightened, can this happen to me without my even knowing it, without my having any behavioral change at all? And that's the kind of thing that we have to keep over and over again emphasizing. We respect your concern, we understand your concern, but the evidence base tells us that that is not going to happen. And we have to say that a lot. We have to say it today, and I'll have to say it tonight on TV, and Tom Friedman will say it tomorrow on TV, and we'll try as best as we can to continue to get the message out. One, one, one follow-up. 
Uh, who bears ultimate responsibility for what did happen, the breakdown that happened in Texas? Is it the hospital? Is it the CDC that didn't send out clear enough guidelines in the beginning? Um, and you say you're taking steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. Is it sending out clearer guidelines, being more um, communicative? What, what specifically is being done? I think it's with, as with most things, uh, it is about making sure, and I think Dr. Fauci just in his response to the question, we cannot over communicate uh, about this issue. And we cannot over communicate in two ways. One, because of the question that was posed with regard to how people feel. And then the second is, this is an execution game in terms of both what's happening on the ground, and that's why it is so important to have the United States military, because there is no one that can help with execution. It is the same in the United States. So the steps that we have to take are about making sure execution, execution, execution. And that gets to your question, which is, that is why we need to communicate and communicate again and communicate with clarity. And if there was anything that people, that's why there are 100 different documents that have been put up on the CDC website, because we put up the document, we get the call if there's a question and for some reason people don't feel it's clear or have an additional question, we get it up, we answer their question, but we're trying to disseminate that information more broadly. And so what we want to do is, because this is about communication and execution, is continue to do that and do it as much and as quickly as we can. Thank you. And later tonight, remarks by retired Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. He recently spoke at Georgetown Law School about his life, his legal career, and the Supreme Court. We'll have his comments starting at 10 o'clock Eastern Time here on C-SPAN. This weekend on the C-SPAN Networks, tonight at 10 Eastern on C-SPAN, a conversation with retired U.S. Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. On Saturday night at 9 Eastern, the founder and former chair of Microsoft, Bill Gates, on the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa. And Sunday evening at 8 on Q&A, the director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, Dr. Janetta Cole. And tonight, at 8 on C-SPAN 2, authors John Yu and Bruce Fine talk about war and the Constitution. Saturday night at 10, on Book TV's Afterwards, author Heather Cox Richardson on the history of the Republican Party and live Sunday at noon on Book TV's In Depth. Joan Biskupic, legal affairs editor in charge at Reuters and Supreme Court biographer. Tonight at 8 on American History TV on C-SPAN 3, historians and authors talk about